Following the end of the Second World War, the United States was a power on an unparalleled basis. The U.S. economy had survived the war unlike other nations like Germany, Britain, France, whose industrial centers had been destroyed by bombings, invasion in the, in, as far as Germany and France are concerned. So if you're outside of the United States or within the United States and you want to buy a manufactured good, uh, you're probably going to get it from a U.S. manufacturer. Basically, these factories have been closed during the Great Depression. They're going to be fired up again as the United States government pays guys like Henry Ford uh, to start producing tanks, planes, this type of thing needed for war. So the U.S. industry is superior to any other industry uh, in the world. And the U.S. has got technologies that other countries don't possess. Um, the U.S. has developed an air force that uh, has these planes, pressurized planes that can fly, fly further, uh, can fly higher than any other planes. The U.S. Navy has eclipsed the British Navy as the most powerful Navy in the world as they build up this Navy to beat Imperial Japan. So the United States military is incredibly powerful. Uh, and the U.S. is in possession of a weapon that had never been seen before in world history, this atomic bomb. Uh, as we talked about last time, the U.S. had this Manhattan Project. It had come up with this way to split the atom, and the U.S. now possesses a bomb that can destroy an entire city in a single explosion. So the U.S., it looks like, is going to stand as the lone superpower in the world uh, beginning in 1945. But as we're soon going to see, there's going to be an unlikely rival emerge out of the ashes of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union prior to World War II had been second tier nation. If we were doing these arbitrary rankings of countries, you know, it wasn't up there with Britain, France. It wasn't up there with the United States. It was a physically large nation, but its army wasn't very well developed as... Uh, the Germans found out when they invaded in 1941. Uh, Soviet industry was getting on its feet, but it didn't rival Britain, France, United States before the Second World War. But what happened when Germany invaded and the Soviet Union gets involved in this war is it's going to mobilize the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin's leadership. And we'll see industry will develop for the purpose of fighting Germany. The Soviet army will grow larger and larger and larger over the course of the war. And by the end of the war, Soviet Union still is going to be in rubbles. 20 million plus of its people killed uh, during the course of the war. But we'll see that the foundation started during the Second World War. Soviets will build on that, and they're going to use this influence gained in the Second World War. As we mentioned, the Soviets are going to be occupying these countries in Eastern Europe that had initially been taken over by uh, Nazi Germany, and then Soviet Union is going to come back through, take them over after uh, pushing Germany back. Soviets are going to use this increased influence to grow their power further. And what this is going to see is the Soviet Union will eventually start rivaling the United States in not just military terms, uh, but it's going to start providing competition to the United States as far as industry and as far as influence on the global stage. And this is going to result in this Cold War. So we're about to talk about this Cold War between Russia and the United States. Before we talk about this Cold War, just know that the Cold War, there's a lot of different dates you can put to it. You know, some people say it starts right in 1945 and it goes up to 1991. Some people say the heart of the Cold War, you know, maybe 47 to 62, and then you get sort of a cold, cooler Cold War. Um, basically, it's going to be post-World War II up until uh, the late eight, 1980s, early 1990s. And what we mean with Cold War is that the two main antagonists, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, um, Soviet Union and the United States, um, they're not going to directly fight one another outside of a couple limited, you know, brief engagements uh, that some people will point to. Uh, you don't see direct fighting between, between the two main combatants. It's going to be more of a proxy war where we're going to see third world countries, uh, third world countries duke it out, and these guys are going to use these uh, revolutions in, in these other countries as sort of their battlegrounds. So let's actually start there. Let's clear up some of the misconceptions with the Cold War. 
one thing you need to know about this Cold War is don't think of it as a battle between capitalists and communists, okay? Now, it is going to be that to an extent, but there, it's not going to encompass the Cold War entirely. So, first of all, what is capitalism? Basically, capitalism would be people competing on a free market if you have a good and you make it cheaper and better than somebody else you put it on a free market and you have consumers customers they're gonna probably purchase the, the good that is cheaper better manufactured than the other good and those who produce more goods are and for cheaper better prices are gonna sell more goods and they're going to achieve success those who maybe don't work as hard don't produce as good of uh, products are going to uh, not be as successful so it's basically this free market system where you have competition for consumer interest the better you do the better products you produce the better you're gonna do now what is communism okay now communism is essentially a system where you have the government owning industry all right so instead of private individuals owning industry the government owns industry so you have governments running factories they're the ones producing the goods and the thought process behind uh, this system is that if um, if you have the government producing the goods they can better produce goods to meet the needs of the people and they can take the spoils of these goods and distribute them to the people so think about it as socialism government owning the means of production but then you nationalize all industries the government controls industries and then it can better provide for the needs of the people um, and in addition communism in general would be a classless society so if the government owns all private property you're not going to have the ultra wealthy you're not going to have the ultra poor because if you're a communal society everybody contributes everybody takes a part in the spoils everybody receives a part of the spoils so capitalism free market private enterprise better product sells those people are successful that work harder produce better product innovate better and those who don't are sort of at the bottom of the free market system so you have sort of the haves have nots communist the uh, government controls things it better distributes the spoils hypothetically and uh, and then it can um, uh, meet the needs of the people better well the thing is when we talk about this Cold War both sides and particularly the main antagonists here the United States and the Soviet Union neither are going to be completely capitalist the United States isn't and its allies are, aren't going to be completely capitalist and the Soviet Union and its allies are not going to be completely communist and we've talked about this before so the United States is it entirely a free market you know towards the Gilded Age we didn't have much regulation it was somewhat of a free market then but what have we seen since that time we've seen government regulation we just talked about the Hepburn Act we've seen the Federal Trade Commission be put in place uh, we've seen uh, Sherman Antitrust Act we've seen again Bureau of Corporations uh, then we've seen government regulation in other forms and again it's not going to be entirely free market in the United States because the governments are going to essentially run some industries who puts out schools local governments so the city government will build a school who in uh, the United States provides for fire departments the government uh, usually local governments who builds the army you know who protects the country that's a uh, national government so they provide a service well that's not entirely capitalist that's not entirely free market so you can't just say they're entirely capitalist over here and you go over to the Soviet Union they're not entirely communist they had somewhat tried that following the Russian Revolution but they quickly discovered that if you try and pay a scientist the same as you do a street sweeper this is gonna cause a lot of discontent and you're gonna see a lot of people getting upset hey why is this guy getting uh, more benefits than I am so they'd sort of instituted a different pay scale for different positions in the Soviet Union uh, uh, so that's one thing uh, you talk about members of the Communist Party in, in the Soviet Union you'd have people that 
um, know people or people that had joined the Communist Party as a young person. They get high up in the Communist Party, and when they get there, they're going to get a lot more benefits, sort of sliding under the table um, uh, benefits that other people that maybe weren't prominent members of the Communist Party would get. And you're also going to have corruption. You know somebody, you might get a better deal when you take the money you're paid to the you know, uh, government-run store. If you know the store owner, maybe he's going to sell you a little bit more for your money. So we're going to see that sort of this black market will form in the Soviet Union. Corruption is going to be in the Soviet Union. Uh, and just like in the United States, the government's going to be running some things that in an entirely free market system they wouldn't run. So not completely communist, not completely capitalist on either side, all right? And another way the capitalist communist model is flawed is that it's not going to be always be capitalist countries on one side, communist countries on the other side. Cuz the United States, its main allies, Britain, France, they're capitalists or they're primarily capitalist, but the United States will sometimes be allied with countries like China, at least for part of the Cold War, the US has its ally in China. They're communist. The Soviet Union will occasionally incorporate ca uh, countries that you would describe as capitalist. They'll be Soviet Union allies uh, during this Cold War. So you'll occasionally see communists side with the United States. You'll occasionally see capitalist countries uh, side with the Soviet Union. It's not as simple as capitalism versus communism, okay? As a matter of fact, probably the best way you can think of the Cold War is you can think of it as a war for markets, all right? So uh, the United States has basically learned this neo-colonialist model where if you get political influence or economic influence in a country, this is good for the people in the United States. You can sell your goods there uh, in this third world country, and you can get resources from this country. It doesn't even necessarily have to be third world, but you can get this uh, resources from this country, and it's going to make your citizens happier because they're selling their goods for cheaper to this country, and they're getting resources from this country for cheaper. So you go to a Latin American country because the United States has uh, can pull the strings in these various countries they can force these countries to buy them, their goods cheaper and make these countries send the resources to the United States instead of someone else. So that's making the U.S. wealthy. Well, the Soviet Union, especially when it starts to become powerful post-World War II, it wants uh, these markets as well. So what we're going to see and what we're going to be leading to is the world, which had been colonized by Britain, France, other European countries, because of a, some reasons we'll discuss, is a, is going to come up for grabs, and we're going to see all these newly independent countries, particularly Africa and Asia, and you'll have the Soviet Union say, now that Britain and France are going out of this country, and they've been sending their goods to Britain and France, boy, it'd be nice if I could sell my goods to them, and I could get resourced from them. The United States will say the same thing. Maybe now this country's independent, I can get new markets there. I can get resources from it. So both the Soviet Union and the United States will look at this country, let's say it's some Central African country, and they're going to see um, a way to make their citizens happy. So if the U.S. can get the resources from this country, it'll make U.S. citizens happy. And if the Soviet Union can make uh, uh, get the resources from this country, it'll make its citizens happy. All right, so... It's almost going to be this fight for markets, and this is going to be the model we'll see. This is why we call it the Cold War, because while the United States and the Soviet Union see this third world country, or, you know, whatever third world country, and the word third world is a uh, country that is not influenced. First world is the ones influenced by the United States and its allies. Second world, the ones that are influenced by the Soviet Union and its allies. Third world is basically a country that's up for grabs. That's the classification of it. Both are going to sort of salivate over these countries, and they're going to try to do what they can to make sure they get economic influence and political control of the country. So both sides will use their resources to uh, try to gain control. So what you'll see in the Cold War is a lot of proxy wars. So instead of the United States sending its army to this country, we don't want to do that. We learned a lesson from the Philippines. Uh, we Soviet Union doesn't want to do that because it doesn't want to directly confront the United States with its nuclear weapons. What they'll do is instead they'll fund rebels in their country, you know, the or uh, dissident groups in their country. So the Soviet Union wants pro-Soviet 
communists to win because they, they know they're going to sell their goods to the Soviet Union if that's the case. The United States wants pro-Western, pro-U.S. capitalist countries win. So this thing is going to be uh, not directly fighting, and it's going to be a fight for markets, okay? That's the number one thing I would say with the, when we're talking this cold world. Think of it as a battle for markets between the United States primarily on one side and the Soviet Union on the other side, fighting for third world countries, okay? So um, basically, and this is going to be what we're talking about, Soviet Union will emerge from this thing and, and have its direct influence. The United States has its direct influence, and basically its indirect influence over Latin America. But we'll see a lot of countries emerge in the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s uh, as Britain and France lose control, colonial control of these countries. Russia will say, man, I want the resources from this country. The United States will say, man, I want the resources from this country. And uh, and basically, they're, they're going to have a proxy war in this country. So we'll just arm rebels on one side. We'll arm rebels on one side. If the Soviet guy wins out, yay, Soviet Union, they're going to sell us their stuff. We'll sell them our goods. If the United States-backed guy wins out, uh, we'll sell them our goods. They'll sell us uh, their goods. So battle for markets, okay? A lot of fighting in the third world. Another thing I want you to think when you think of this Cold War is that there's no good guys and no bad guys, okay? So the thing is, and by the way, one other thing with this this uh, market influence, this is going to be important because if you don't get these resources from these third world countries, it's going to make quality of life in their home countries go down. So the United States wants to get these third world countries to buy their goods because they know it makes their citizens happy. The Soviet Union especially wants to get markets to new countries because the whole principle of communism is that the nation is going to make, by uniting and allowing the nation to run industry, it's going to make things better for you. And it's sort of built on this promise. And if you don't make life people better for the citizens, they'll blame the government. So we need to sell our goods to this third world country. We need to get these resources or people are going to look at the government and say, you're not providing for us. Uh, so both sides want these markets. The Soviets need these markets. And that's what this picture here is from. Uh, in this, uh, if you've ever read the book Animal Farm, uh, the government, the, the pigs that run this farm promise a better tomorrow, which is this windmill. And basically they tell the people, if you, uh, the other animals, you've got to work to build this windmill. The second the windmill gets up, life is going to be great. Well, the Soviet Union sort of lives on the promise of life getting better once the windmill's built, once the promise of a better tomorrow is going to come around. And this promise is going to rely on increasing Soviet influence. So, again, think about it as a war for influence, right? Final thing you need to remember with this Cold War is that there's no good guys and there's no bad guys, right? So I grew up in the 1980s with all these spy movies and you always had Soviets are mean and they're, they're so, uh, uh, they're out to get the United States and they're out to destroy it. Well, I think in the Soviet Union they were watching the same thing. They were probably watching American spies trying to kill the United States, uh, be evil, you know, pull out the rug from uh, the Soviet Union. In reality, both the Soviet Union and the United States are trying to make life better for their citizens. Both are nervous about the other guy. Both are nervous that the other guy is going to invade them or their allies. They're going to unleash an atomic bomb. They're going to do something to hurt them and their citizens. So don't think of it as good guys and bad guys. Both are going to do incredibly horrendous things, especially when you get to these third world nations, you know, when they start sending arms to groups that are going to be horrible things to uh, do horrible things to the other side. The Soviets will also fund groups that are going to be doing horrible things. So both are going to be doing terrible things. Both are going to be doing it for the goods of their citizens. Neither is going to be... M especially more cruel than the other. And this, you can see this in um, this uh, news crew actually went to the Soviet Union, uh, I believe it was in the 1980s, and uh, they asked the Soviets, you know, from an American perspective, why do you guys have so many missiles pointed at the United States? Because, spoilers, the Soviets are going to get the missiles or get the atomic weapon. Uh, well, the Soviets, these the group of students are going to say, 
well, uh, those are to defend us uh, from you guys. And then, well, why does the United States have missile point of the Soviets? Because they're mean or because they want to kill us. See, people in the same thing, the students in the United States would say the th same thing. Our missiles are for defense. Their missiles are to kill us. It's sort of this misunderstanding that you're going to see with the Cold War. All right. So how is this Cold War going to start? Because it doesn't seem like it should have started. The Soviet Union and the United States were allies during World War II. Both had joined together to, find, to fight the Germans in Italy um, uh, who had invaded the Soviet Union. 1941, June 1941, the United States goes to Germany and Italy, December 1941. So they essentially join at the same time. We'd had FDR and we'd had, uh, you know, Joseph Stalin working together. They would planned uh, together how to defeat Nazi Germany, uh, Mussolini controlled Italy. So how does it start when you have these two allies? How do you go from being, you know, compatriots working together um, to being pointing missiles at each other uh, and threatening to kill the other guy and, and essentially eliminate all life in their country. What happens? Well, the main thing that's going to set off this Cold War is going to be what happens in Eastern Europe. So we talked about last time Yalta conference. At Yalta, FDR met with Churchill and Stalin, and there was a discussion about what to do with the lands that the Germans had occupied during World War II or allies of Nazi Germany, where you had essentially this Nazi-controlled governments had thrown out previous constitutions. They'd installed their own constitutions. They basically put the German flag down in some areas, or they had, um, you know, just basically... Uh, uh, just completely eliminated the government, put a new government in its place. Well, after the Germans are kicked out, now we don't have any government. Well, at Yalta, it was decided whoever occupies the country uh, will be the one to hold elections, and these elections will replace the government in charge. So the Soviet Union, because it pushed the Germans out of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, it's going to hold elections in these countries. The United States and Britain, they're the ones that had taken over Italy. The uh, British had invaded Greece. So they're going to be holding elections in these countries because they're occupying them. Well, if you have a country that is army is overseeing elections and you have soldiers standing outside of a ballot box where the people are deciding the future of the country... A lot of times the people that are almost all the time, the person that's going to win is the person that the soldiers want to win, okay? So let's say Poland, um, 1945, Soviets occupy it. They need to replace their government. A ballot's being uh, put around where you got two candidates that want to set up a new government. It's more complex than this, but let's say you have Steve and Bob. Steve believes that Poland should become communist. This is the best economic system. Uh, and we should become communist, and we should become close trading partners with the Soviet Union. So Steve says this. Uh, Bob says, I think Poland should be a capitalist country. I believe this is a e best economic system, and I think we should have close ties to United Kingdom and France, and we should make them our trading partners. Well, if you have a Soviet soldier standing outside the ballot box, he's going to make sure through one method or another that this pro-communist, pro-Soviet guy is going to win. And in Greece, if you have um, one guy saying, I want to be uh, pro-British capitalist, uh, another guy saying, I want to be pro-Soviet communist, the British soldier is going to make sure that uh, the pro-British, pro-capitalist guy is going to win. Now, the way they do this, sometimes simply cheating, just dumping stuff out of the ballot box, uh, propaganda, this is actually the way that United States and Britain will operate as, you know, communism's bad, that type of thing. Um, but what we'll see is the occupying country will get these governments put in place that will, um, uh, that will basically uh, be an ally or a direct ally of uh, the, the occupying nation. So on the capitalist side, United States, uh, France, or United Kingdom, France, United States, uh, they're going to get friendly governments in uh, Greece, Italy, uh, and then, again, these various Eastern European countries, because they're occupied by the Soviet Union, they get uh, uh, pro-Soviet Union governments. There's unusual stuff that happens with Yugoslavia and Finland that, you know, we can't get into. But for the most part, it's the occupying nation uh, that that is going to set the agenda for the future. All right, so 
now you're going to see almost immediately after World War II, the, the, uh, the geographic layout will be something like this. Pro-Soviet communist governments on this side, pro-Western, meaning United States, uh, UK, uh, capitalist United States on this side. These guys are going to gain power, all right? Well, when this starts to happen, you'll look at both sides are going to start looking at each other like, hey, they were kind of unfair. Did, was this truly a fair election here in Czechoslovakia? Did uh, the, the Soviet soldiers actually, you know, allow the people to vote who they wanted to, or did they provide influence with those votes? Well, the Soviets are going to look at the same thing with Greece. Did the British actually allow the people of Greece to vote for who they wanted to, or did they just make sure that uh, they voted for a pro-British guy? Well, again, the answer is going to be corruption on, on both sides, but both sides will start looking at one another with with distrust. Again, it's not it's it's not going to be an immediate Cold War when this happens, but it's just gonna it's just gonna start looking like that at the beginning. Okay, all right. So, United States and Britain. They don't like what's happening in far of these elections. And also, in general, the U.S. and Britain don't necessarily trust that Russia's going to stop or the Soviet Union is going to stop with these areas. They're a little bit concerned that the Soviets might use their newfound military might to, you know, justify military expansion into, to, um, into to other areas. So, all right, USSR has got this great army. Maybe they're going to go, you know, and, and use this as a justification to invade and take over Finland. Say, and this is kind of complicated situation up here. Finland had attacked the Soviet Union with, with uh, the Germans in 1941. Maybe we're going to use this as a justification to try and invade them again like we did during the Winter War. Well, they're nervous about that. Why would they be nervous? Well, because, again, in 1939, the Soviet Union had used its military might to invade Poland and had invaded Finland. So even though they'd fought together on the same side against Germany, the Soviets had also been aggressive like Germany at the beginning of the war. And the United States and British are kind of worried that's going to continue. So they're afraid that the Soviets... Uh, their their military aggression might not have stopped, even though they're gaining this uh, political and economic influence. So maybe they're continue to go further. So there's just distrust. And then you look on the Soviet side, and they look at the United Kingdom, and they're going to say, "Well, how did these guys become so powerful? Uh, France, the United Kingdom, and then the United States, these pro-capitalist countries." They become powerful by, uh, particularly with the United Kingdom and France, by putting boots on the ground in other places, imperial, imperialist colonization, and basically they extracted resources from other countries. So I don't trust them because they'd done this before. Now, you know, this direct colonization uh, had sort of gone out the door as the entire world pretty much had been colonized by the 1900s, but... You know, these guys were sort of the original guys to use uh, military might to expand. So the Soviet Union looks at these guys as imperialists. These guys will look at the Soviet Union as militarily aggressive in a time period where that had gone out, out the door. All right, so that's one sort of thing that's sitting in the background uh, um, in 1945. Another thing that's going to be a disagreement that's going to emerge in 1945, 1946 is disagreements over Germany. So as we talked about at Yalta, they agreed to split Germany into four sections. The Soviet Union would occupy a section, be responsible for denazification. Um, the British would be responsible for a section, denazification here. France gets a little bit of section, denazification. Uh, United States gets a section. It's going to be up to you to denazify, demilitarize, get rid of swastikas, that type of thing. So each side sends its soldiers here, and they're going to spend... 1945, 46, into 47, um, making sure there are no dissidents, no revolutionaries continuing to fight for, for the Germans, um, you know, no people trying to get a revolution or anything like that, seizing weapons, you know, get, changing the curriculum of textbooks and stuff, uh, making sure that no longer are people having these you know, Nazi ideas. Well, the Germany had essentially been destroyed during World War II, either again by the Soviet army invading from the, the east or uh, the American and British army invading from the west, and you got this place in ruins. 
well, what should we do here? Well, the British, uh, the United States, and the French, they're going to sort of take this forgiving approach to Germany. The British, United States, and French hadn't lost nearly as much as the Soviet Union during World War II. Again, Germany had quickly taken over France. Uh, they'd beaten up some of their army, but France surrendered before any major damage could be done. Uh, the United Kingdom, Germany never invaded the UK. Again, they killed people with bombs, but it was only a small percentage of the United Kingdom's population. The United States lost over 400,000 soldiers in the total in the war, and I think in Europe it was, uh, it was uh, much lower than that. But they hadn't lost... Together, they hadn't lost a 20th of what the Soviet Union had lost. Soviet Union lost 20 million people, and the Germans had moved in and leveled all these cities uh, in the Soviet Union, killing people, rape, this type of thing. The Soviet Union's hated the Germans for what they did to their people. So the Soviets, when they come in, they want to just let the Germans suffer in their occupation zone. Uh, the British, United States, and French they kind of have a different approach. The Germans didn't do as much damage to us, and what they're going to do is almost treat the Germans fairly. We're denazifying them, but we're not going to dehumanize them. Uh, and they're actually going to start assisting and rebuilding that type of thing. Uh, they think it'd be, you know, this U.S. mentality they learned all the way back in the Philippines. You went over hearts and minds. It's an easier approach than punishing people in the long run. Uh, but the Soviets don't have this mindset, again, because such a significant portion of their population had been killed by the Germans. So what you're going to see is in the Soviet sector, and this is also going to include East Berlin, because remember Berlin was also divided into four sections. In the Soviet sector, there's going to be uh, a lot of mistreatment uh, against the Germans. Um, oh, shoot, hold on. Uh, what you'll see here is the Soviets will start to... Uh, you know, steal bikes, they'll be rape in the Soviet sector, things like that. You don't see that at nearly as much in the British, French, and United States sector. Disagreements over, um, disagreements over, um, uh, uh, small things, how to deal with Germany. Um, another thing that's going to lead to disagreements and lead to this Cold War, I think it's going to contribute, is the change in leadership that's going to happen at the end of World War II. So as we've been talking about, during World War II, the United States was led for most of World War II by FDR. FDR had been a guy who very much uh, uh, agree with, you know, uh, FDR had been agreeable to Joseph Stalin. He was a very, uh, how should I put this, he was a very uh, reasonable person. He could negotiate better. He could, um, uh, he could talk to Joseph Stalin, keep him calm. Well, FDR, as we mentioned, at the end of World War II, he dies, and he's going to be replaced by this guy. This guy's name's Harry S. Truman. Before we talk a lot about Harry S. Truman, just know that Truman... Well, first of all, you should know, Harry S. Truman, his middle name was S. This is the thing I always find crazy. So, Harry S. Truman does not have a full middle name. His parents... Uh, they're both their their parents were uh, their father's name started with S. They couldn't decide which of their fathers to name Truman after, so they just called him S. And after both grandfathers, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. So Harry S. Truman, maybe you can blame the fact that he's going to be the way he is on the fact that he has an S has just S as his middle name. I'm kind of kidding about that, but Harry S. Truman, he's a decent guy. He's a hardworking guy, but. He is very ornery. He's very standoffish. So what had happened during World War II is when Stalin, who could get very angry uh, and disagreeable, whenever FDR would talk to him, he would calm him down. He would remind him that we are allies. Truman, whenever he meets with uh, Stalin, and this is going to happen uh, shortly after World War II, uh, Truman will not have the same countenance as, uh, as, as FDR did. He's not going to put up for when Stalin is being sort of obtuse, things like that. Um, and the same thing is going to be the case with the British Prime Minister. Uh, Winston Churchill didn't like Stalin in the first place, um, but you know he had sort of come to an understanding with him. Well, Churchill's kicked out in Britain, uh, and he's going to be replaced by a series of prime ministers, and they're not going to have the same understanding with Joseph Stalin. And I think this sort of clash of personalities 
maybe not causes the Cold War, but when the Cold War could have been cooled by, by maybe FDR, when we start seeing these guys disagree with one another, you're not going to be able to see that because you're not going to have his leadership. You're going to have Truman, who, again, is a good guy, but he's not as cool-tempered as FDR. All right, so I, I think a little bit's going to owe to the uh, personalities involved uh, post-World War II. Another thing that I think is going to owe to, uh, you're going to see the outbreak of this Cold War, is that there will be influential parties on both sides that are going to look at one another, look at the other side, and basically they're going to say, I don't trust what they're up to, okay? What we see in post-World uh, uh, War II Germany is the these guys on these side, they're a little bit nervous about these guys on these si this side over here. So when uh, they start occupying their various zones, you'll see Britain and the United States, they're going to post a couple people to just be a little bit watchful here of, uh, of Western Germany. And the reason they do this is, again, because, hey, the Soviets were militarily aggressive before World War II. Who's to say they don't still want to be aggressive and they might push in here? Again, the Soviet army's incredibly powerful. You know, what if on the off chance they come in here and they invade us? So what the British will do is they're going to station a couple soldiers in their section just to watch the Soviet-occupied part of Germany. The United States will do this, too. Well, the Soviets are going to see this, and Soviet advisors to Stalin will start looking at these soldiers over there, and they're going to say, well, the British are imperialists. The United States, they like getting economic influence, political influence places. Are they putting their soldiers there to uh, uh, because they're thinking about invading us? Well, Maybe if you had different political leaders, you would say, no, of course not. They're just a little bit nervous. You know, this is an unusual situation. Let's calm down. But what's going to happen in post-World War II Europe is politicians in, on both sides are going to be influenced by parties that might view the other guy as an aggressor. So in the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin's m main advisors are military people, generals. So if you're talking World War II and you're talking this long push to defeat Germany, the people that gain power, political power in uh, the Soviet Union are going to be those who help defeat Nazi Germany. So generals. So people in the military, they rise into political positions during war. So the people that are advising Stalin are military people. Post-World War II, you start seeing Britain and the United States putting a couple extra soldiers on the border of the Soviet sector over here. These generals will start to say to Stalin, we better put our own soldiers there because these guys might be in a, getting aggressive. They're imperialists. Well, on the United States side, they see the Soviets putting additional soldiers over here. And again, you're going to have these politicians somewhat ornery like Truman. They're going to be advised by a lot of people that also sort of have this mentality of we need to watch out for that guy. And some of the guys that are advising the politicians in Britain and France and the United States are those who can maybe profit from increased military attention. So something we'll talk about later is this military-industrial complex. So in the United States, there are a lot of people that made money during World War II because the United States would government would tax, borrow, write these checks to weapons manufacturers um, for tanks to fight Germany and Japan, things like that. Well, 1945 comes along. These checks are going to start drying up. We don't need the military anymore. We don't need tanks. We don't need planes, uh, ships anymore because uh, the war is over. Well, some of these guys that have been making money off producing these things, Britain and the United States, they don't like this because they liked getting government checks. The government's a really easy customer. He's not very discerning. He just writes a check out, and as long as the tanks function, uh, you the money keeps coming in. So a lot of these military industrial people had gotten used to this sweet, sweet uh, crack or heroin or whatever that the United States government would inject, and I'm like, free government money, yeah, let's build this. This is awesome. Well, post-World War II, they want this stuff to keep coming in, so when you start to see the Soviets putting their own people up here, you've got these powerful industrial people with money in their pocketbooks will start to save their politicians. 
hey, you know, they're probably doing that because they're aggressive. We should station our own soldiers over there. So all this together means you got distrust in there. You've got disagreements over Germany, how to treat Germany. You have influential parties in Soviet Union. So a lot of these generals that have been made, made a lot of, uh, uh, gotten political clout from the war. And in the Western powers, it's these uh, industrialists who made a lot of money off the war. Well, these guys, so the U.S. starts to view the Soviet Union with distrust, and a lot of people view the Soviet Union as having unfairly uh, put its influence on these countries in Eastern Europe through these unfair elections. Well, what do we do about it? Now, a lot of people in the United States, 45, 46, 47, are regarding the Soviet Union as a threat. So what do we do? Well, some people will argue that the United States should act quickly. The Soviet Union, it seems like it's becoming more powerful as they start to clean up from the damage done during World War II. So maybe we should launch a military operation to liberate Eastern Europe. Uh, this guy, uh, George Patton, who had led a tank corps uh, into Germany during World War II, he actually argues that. He argues that while, before they can get their stuff together, we should, um, we should send our tanks into Eastern Europe. Uh, he even advocates rearming Germany and then having the German soldiers rejoin them to invade the Soviet Union. These guys know how it's already done, uh, so we can push them west and we can get them uh, get rid of this communist threat once and for all. A lot of people are going to say, "Well, that's ridiculous." You know, sure we don't trust these guys, but they're they were our allies in World War II, and we might not like communism, but you know, you can't just attack somebody for that reason. Uh, for this same reason, uh, you're going to see people talk down that advocate using the nuclear bomb. 46, 47, some people will say, hey, we're the only country in the world that has this nuclear capability. We should use it to bomb the Soviet Union, and then we can uh, weaken them, and we can liberate Eastern Europe this way. Again, this is going to be talked down because... One, the United States doesn't have a ton of nuclear weapons, uh, so they've only got a couple. You're not going to be able to blow up very much with this. And the Soviet Union, even if you did use nuclear weapons, its army has gotten so powerful during World War II, there's a very good chance it can march through. Uh, even with U.S. forces, French forces, British forces all joined together, Soviets can push through, take France, uh, take Italy, and potentially threaten uh, Britain. So that's going to be talked down. And again, any initiation of a surprise attack will be talked down because as World War I, uh, or I'm sorry, World War II was sold as, the Japanese did the surprise attack on us and sneak attacks are not the way to do things. So the aggressive approach will be dismissed almost immediately. Again, these guys are our allies and you can't just go to war because you're disagreeing with the governments they installed in Eastern Europe. Well, a guy named George Keenan, who is a planner for the United States State's Department, State Department, is going to come up with an idea called containment instead to deal with the Soviet threat. What containment will say is that we don't need to get aggressive with the Soviet Union. All you need to do is prevent it from expanding, and if you prevent it from expanding, then um, uh, in communism in general from expanding, then it will collapse upon itself, all right? So communism, we talked about this earlier, is relying on the idea that if the people give this power to the state, the state controls industry, it can better distribute the spoils of industry to the people, and it can plan things for the future that you couldn't have it in a free market. So the state can take on big projects, the capitalist government couldn't, it can distribute things better to the workers, it can take care of the people better, and if you work under this communist system, you give up this power to the state, the state will improve things. So it relies on improving things. Well, George Keenan's going to say improving things for the people of the Soviet Union and these communist countries, these newly communist countries, relies on <clears throat> increasing markets, so expanding economic influence and political influence. Uh, so you want these goods to come in from these other countries. You want to be able to sell your goods to these countries. If you don't get these goods coming from the other other countries and people's lives don't improve they're going to look to the state and say you failed us now this doesn't happen in a capitalist society because the way capitalist society they're structured it's again kind of a benefit to, to uh, capitalism at least for governments that are under capitalism is 
the way capitalist system, if you don't succeed, people point and say, it's your fault you didn't succeed. You know, the government stays out of thing. It's your fault. Now, whether that's true or not, you know, is, is uh, definitely up for debate. But under a communist system, if your life doesn't get better, the state has promised you your life is going to get better. And so if it doesn't, then you're going to blame the state and there might be a revolution. So basically, Keenan says, we don't have to be aggressive. We just have to prevent this better tomorrow from being built. Again, if you uh, ever read that book, Animal Farm, they're promising this windmill. That's basically what the Soviet Union and these new communist governments are promising their people. You work towards this, tomorrow will be better. So by preventing these new markets from being gained, you prevent the windmill, you prevent the uh, better future from being carried out. So if we contain it and we prevent communism from sp spreading its influence, new countries from becoming communist, then again, we're going to prevent this uh, better tomorrow from coming out. So contain communism, don't let it grow, and it will collapse upon itself, right? So how do you do this uh, in this net new Cold War that's emerging uh, in the post-World War II Europe? Well, one of the ways that uh, the U.S. is going to carry this out is by passing something called the National Security Act in 1947. What the National Security Act does is it will do things like uh, create the Central Intelligence Agency. So the United States had had spies in World War II. They'd had spies going all the way back to George Washington. You'd always had people gathering information, but this was under the U.S. Army. It was somewhat disorganized. What the Central Intelligence Agency will be is a organized unit to de to gather international information, spying, uh, and other means of uh, gathering information. So what we want to do is we're worried about the Soviet Union. So if we send some spies here uh, to the Soviet Union or these newly communist countries, they can keep an eye out for movements of tanks, movements of planes. They can keep an eye out for developments in, say, the Su Soviet nuclear program. And so we can be better prepared for a threat that's going to emerge. So if you are worried about containment, you're worried about, you know, Soviet Union invading Austria or Yugoslavia or something like that, uh, or maybe in invading Western uh, Germany, Western half of Germany, then you can send all your armies there to prepare defenses for this. So just in case this happens, we're going to be prepared. Soviets may be putting a lot of money in, um, uh, sending money to Greece. We're going to see Greece get in a civil war. Uh, they're going to be supporting communists in Greece. All right, if that's the case, we need to counter them there. So gather information to uh, prevent um, this uh, from happening. Uh, other things this uh, National Security Act will do is it will um, uh, create this uh, joint chiefs of staff for the president. So the president's going to have these joint chiefs of staff who will keep them apprised on a nearly daily basis of what's going on in Europe, again, just to keep the president informed of, um, of the Soviet threat. Another thing the National Security Act is going to do, and we're going to talk about this later, it's going to desegregate the military. Again, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but up to this point, you'd had black units, white units. It desegregates it. One of the things the Soviet Union is going to be pressing the United States and uh, Western nation on is inequality. Again, communism promises rough equality uh, between people, uh, and you have this dramatic inequality in the United States uh, between whites and blacks, and it's institutionalized there in the army. Uh, so this National Security Act will be almost countering that Soviet propaganda, and it also makes things more efficient. It's sort of silly that you have to have different facilities for whites and blacks. So if we're going to be fighting the Soviet Union, we've got to have the most efficient army as possible. So National Security Act creates the CIA, Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, and then, you know, desegregates the military. Again, we're going to talk more about that last one later. All right, so containment, we got this National Security Act. What else do we do to prevent the Soviets from expanding, gaining these new markets? Well, Harry Truman will come up with something called the Truman Doctrine a, a beginning in 1947. So what the Truman Doctrine will be is Truman proposes in 1947 that the United States should not directly fight the Soviets. But what they should do is they should support nations by providing arms, military advisors, and uh, to countries threatened by communist takeover, okay? So if we want to prevent communi communism from spreading, 
we need to make sure that countries that are could potentially in the line of communist takeover uh, do not get taken over by communists. So what does this mean? Well, it's first going to be applied in Greece, and actually we're going to see it directly applied here in Greece and Turkey. So in 1947, Greece was under occupy, occupation by the British. As we talked about, Britain had uh, occupied Greece post-World uh, War II. They made sure that a pro-capitalist government got put in place in Greece. Well, Greece had gotten destroyed during World War II. A lot of uh, the country was in ruins. Uh, and when the British held elections to replace the government of Greece, a lot of people in Greece wanted a communist government. And this is because if things get broken up, torn to pieces. Communism has a lot of appeal because uh, it promises you the state's going to take care of you, uh, you know, which is better than capitalism in a destroyed country because basically it's up to you to rebuild on your own. So when Britain uh, oversees elections, it may have, it was a pretty close vote. You know, a lot of people are going to argue it actually Greece should have uh, become a communist country, uh, but Britain made sure that a pro-British uh, pro-capitalist government got put in its place. Well, following uh, this installation of this new pro-Western government, these communists are going to start leading a civil war in Greece to overthrow the pro-Western, pro-capitalist government. But the British had kept this, um, this, this communist Greek faction in check because it had maintained its mili military forces in Greece, uh, uh, 45, 46, 47. But in 1947... Uh, Britain's going to be facing an economic crisis at home, and it can't afford to maintain its troops in Greece, and it's going to have to pull them out. So when this happens, a lot of people fear that the pro-communist forces will overthrow the capitalist government in Greece, and this Greece will fall to communism, again, expanding markets for uh, communist country, Soviet Union. Well, to prevent this from happening, Harry Truman is going to propose this Truman Doctrine that says... Uh, let's go ahead and give the pro-capitalist Western supporters, pro-Western supporters in Greece, weapons, firearms, military advisors to defeat these ca uh, communists. At the same time, uh, Turkey is going to be facing a crisis from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union will threaten to use this 1800s treaty. It's a defunct treaty that hadn't been uh, uh, withheld or upheld for a very long time. Uh, but basically, the Soviet Union, it wants access to the Mediterranean. It's going to cite this treaty from like the Crimean War that says that it's uh, it should have access through this land right here that's owned by Turkey. Well, Turkey is going to look around and say, you know, this is ridiculous. We've al already always had uh, access to this land. Nobody had ever upheld this treaty. We don't want to abide by it. But the Soviet Union now being powerful post-World War II they're threatening to um, take this land from Turkey militarily. So both of these things threaten to expand the influence of communism. So Truman will go to Congress and he's going to ask for um, 400 million to aid the communist or uh, pro-capitalist forces in Greece and to support Turkey, provide arms to Turkey to prevent the Soviets from uh, uh, claiming this land as part of this treaty. So all these uh, weapons will flow into the uh, Greek government, the pro-Western Greek government, and Turkey will be supported by uh, these weapons and military advisors from the United States. The United States actually parked some of its navy here, not directly to get in conflict with the Soviet Union, but sort of to threaten that if you try to enforce this with tre uh, Turkey with uh, treaty with Turkey, then uh, we've got their back, and this will work. The pro-Western, pro-capitalist forces are going to defeat the pro-communists in the Greek Civil War. This is what's depicted here. Uh, the communist uh, faction will be defeated. And then the same thing is going to happen in Turkey. Uh, the Soviets will actually stand down. They won't uh, try to uphold that treaty. So the U.S. will win this containment. The Soviets don't expand. All right, so this is a victory for containment. But there's going to be a further problem. All right, so... One of the biggest problems is going to be that f following World War II, a good uh, portion of Europe had been destroyed. So you had uh, Italy be torn to pieces, France be torn to pieces, Germany being torn to pieces. Just about everywhere in Europe uh, looked something like this. It's bombed, you know, um, rail lines have been torn up by one side or another, roads don't work. 
Well, this is obviously going to be a problem, and it's going to be an especially a problem because these new governments, a lot of these new governments just getting off their feet um, post-World War II, aren't going to have the money to pay for it. And it's not like they're going to be able to collect taxes because a lot of people can't work because you can't get to work if the roads are uh, debris, if the train tracks are ripped up. So how are you supposed to get an economy started when the infrastructure is torn up? Well, because of this, we will see in places like Italy, um, to a lesser extent, France, uh, you know, Spain, uh, Portugal. Spain didn't really get torn up by the war, but Denmark. Some of these countries started to see these communist parties start to gain power because they advoc started arguing correctly that, hey, your capitalist government isn't getting things up and running. You're not able to work. You're not able to feed your family. They're not providing for you. If you install a communist government, uh, the state will take care of your basic needs. And as we just talked about, it, there is a lot of appeal to communism for somebody that had just been torn torn apart. You know, if we uh, you know take from the handful of wealthy that are still left in the country, provide for the poor, then that sounds good if you're poor, which again, most of these uh, people in these countries uh, after the devastation of World War II are. So the communist parties in these various European nations are starting to gain steam 45, 46, 47, 48. So what are we supposed to do with this? Uh, again, the countries, governments themselves, poor Western governments can't, uh, they're in debt. They can't afford to revitalize this infrastructure. Uh, and the longer this goes on, the more power the communist parties within these countries get. So what the U.S. is going to decide to do in 1948 is listen to the uh, Secretary of State, a guy named George Marshall, who will propose that the United States just start sending money to countries that are threatened, are, are basically torn apart in Europe. This is going to be something called the Marshall Plan. So if these pro-Western governments uh, can't afford to pay for their infrastructure, let's help them. Let's send over train cars. Let's send over railroad tracks. Let's send over the... Um, uh, you know, automobiles that can maybe help them cl uh, clean up trucks, stuff like that, to help them get on back on their feet. Just throw money in industrial goods at them so they don't uh, get taken over by communists, okay? So, United States Marshal, uh, George Marshall will propose offering this not just to, you know, pro-Western countries. He actually says, let's offer it to everybody in Europe. So Poland could hypothetically take it. Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania. The Soviet Union could hypothetically take this. We're just going to straight up offer free stuff to anybody that wants it. Now, as we're going to talk about the U.S. economy, again, for the reasons that you know we talked about a little bit before, the industry didn't get destroyed like a lot of these European countries' industry. U.S. industry is doing well. Um, and uh, there's the thought that in order to keep it going well, you know, maybe we can start handing out government checks to railroad car companies, automobile companies, uh, to build these items to send to Europe. So we keep our industry going while at the same time uh, we support these governments in, in Europe and we sort of win them over to our side. So let's throw money at Europe, basically. Marshall Plan, let's help rebuild Europe and uh, in doing so, uh, we support U.S. industry by writing government checks to the uh, U.S. industry. Well, uh, this plan is going to be incredibly effective because if you're a European government, you hear the United States is offering free cash, uh, free stuff, then most European countries will say, I'm in on this. And the U.S. will start sending, again, all this uh, essentially money, industrial goods over to these various countries to help them rebuild. Uh, and this is effectively going to prevent these guys, help rebuild infrastructure, prevent the Communist Party from growing stronger in a number of countries. Now, some countries in Europe will not accept the U.S. aid. And in particular, we're going to have Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, the Soviet Union. They could hypothetically have taken this because George Marshall said any European country uh, could take it. So, these countries will say no. Why would they say no? Free stuff. Well, if you are taking stuff from a capitalist country, you know, and they have so much they can just give away, doesn't that say that sort of capitalism is doing better than communism? 
Wouldn't that be a, an acknowledgement of the superiority of their system? So what we'll see is the Soviet Union and the various communist governments of these Eastern European nations will say, thank you, but no thank you. Uh, we think we have a superior economic system. We're going to get back on our feet on our own. So they refuse these overtures. And by the way, one of the things that George Marshall thought is that, hey, they keep seeing these superior U.S. industrial goods come in. Maybe this will get some of these people over here to rethink their uh, communist government. But they don't accept it, so that, that thought process isn't going to go through. So, again, just throw money, uh, throw money at things. All right, so this is uh, Marshall Plan, Truman Doctrine, part of this containment policy. What else is the U.S. going to do? Well, U.S. is also going to decide, all right, with the, uh, the disagreements that are rising up, one thing that would be really good for Western Europe, in particular our allies, Britain, France, now Italy, um, these Western uh, European capitalist nations, would be, it would be nice if we had a buffer state to prevent immediate Soviet takeover. Again, the Soviet army is strong. If a war did break out, man, it'd be nice if we had Germany to um, uh, sort of provide a buffer before they can get to us. So in 1948, Britain, the United States, and France are going to agree to unite their occupied sectors of Germany. Basically, they are going to say, we are going to uh, make our German, uh, our countries into a single Germany. Uh, we're going to call this West Germany and we're going to install a single government over them. So up to this point the U.S. had basically been running its sector, France its sector, the British its their sector. Uh, but uh, following 1948 they're still going to have soldiers in these regions but essentially they're going to uh, turn them over to be run by a single West German government. They also unite their sectors of Berlin. So what had been three different occupied sectors is going to become one under a single German government. Same thing in West Berlin. Uh, and these guys, uh, United States, France, and Britain, will decide to start rearming the Germans. So it's not going to be immediately giving them tanks or anything like that. We'll eventually get to that. Uh, but basically, we're going to let them start running things themselves, uh, being their own police force. So you're the Soviet Union. You're nervous about these guys. And now you're seeing they're taking this country that had just killed 20 million of your people and they're allowing them to basically start running things themselves again and they're giving them guns back again. If you're the Soviet Union, doesn't that kind of seem threatening? I mean, if you're the uh, British, France, and the United States, it makes sense because you're providing, you need a buffer because you don't trust the Soviet Union. But now you're seeing them do it. Uh, that's kind of scary. So what the Soviet Union is going to do in reaction to what uh, the uniting of these three uh, occupation zones in West Germany is the Soviet Union is essentially going to close off East Germany. It's going to basically put up these borders around East Germany. It's going to form its own East German government. And what the Soviets will do is it's going to try to close off Berlin uh, entirely from the West. So up to this point, you could just walk back and forth between these areas. I mean, it's uh, occupation zones, different, you know, whoever, different European powers occupying these things. If you're German, you just go back and forth. Same thing with Berlin. But what the Soviets are going to say is, now we're feeling very threatened, so we're going to close off. We're going to create our own East Germany. And as part of this East Germany, we're going to take Berlin. And so what the Soviets do is they're going to put a blockade around Berlin and basically... They're not going to kill the Americans, British, and French that are in there. They're not going to take over the government, but they're going to uh, surround it with tanks, and basically uh, there's a road into Berlin. They're going to cut it off and say, this is now part of East Germany. This is now part of the Soviet sector. So Americans, uh, British, and French, what the Soviets are hoping here is that, all right, if we're clicking up here, you guys are going to have to give up your claim to this area because now you're not going to be able to get food into this region because uh, we basically cut off transportation of the area. Uh, you can't, you know, bring food trucks, anything like that into West Germany, uh, West Berlin. I mean, uh, so you can't get that stuff there. So they close this off and they almost dare the United States, Britain, France to do something. Hypothetically, and this is what some people are going to argue, 
This is war. We should go ahead and we should liberate West Berlin, attack it with planes, tanks, things like that. And this is the fight we're looking for. This is maybe an excuse to bomb the Soviets using our nuclear weapons. But that's not what's going to happen. Uh, basically, cooler heads will prevail. And what the U.S. is going to decide to do is almost ignore the fact that Soviets have blockaded West Germany. And what the U.S. will start doing is taking these planes that had been used to drop bombs uh, during World War II, and instead it's going to load them up with fuel, with food, with coal, things like that. And it's just going to start flying them over the Soviet blockade. So this begins in uh, 48. It's going to continue into 49. Uh, you'll sometimes hear this called the Berlin Airlift. And it'll just go past the Soviet blockade. And you'll see a planes taking off. I think it's one every nine minutes or so uh, from West Germany into uh, this West Berlin area. And then the planes will start providing food, things like that, uh, to the West German people. This is going to be kind of weird in the United States. Some people are going to be saying, you know, why are we putting so much risk to uh, get these West Germans uh, or these West Berliners uh, our support? Well, the U.S. sees them as allies, and they don't want to give up West Berlin because it would be a victory for the Soviets. Again, containment. So uh, we're going to go ahead and continue to send this food in. So what... Uh, the Soviets had hoped to do was pressure the United States and, and Britain and uh, France into giving up their sectors. Instead, they basically start flying in, and it, it looks like they're almost heroes, because whereas the Soviets cut off these sectors from f food, fuel, things like that, uh, the United States, Ber uh, Britain, and France will start supplying these goods. And so it makes them look heroic to the West Germans, uh, West Berliners, and so uh, uh, it actually makes the U.S. look good. Um, so U.S. begins this uh, Berlin airlift. And hypothetically, the Soviets could have shot down these planes coming into West Berlin. But if they did, they would have instigated a war. And, and they didn't want that, especially, uh, you know, being at this nuclear disadvantage as they were uh, in 48, uh, beginning of 49. All right. So um, um this uh, blockade eventually it's going to be lifted but what the soviets will do is um they're going to close off uh west berlin to west germany except they're going to start allowing one railroad and one road to get into west berlin and this by the way is going to be the way things are for the rest of the cold war if you want to drive from west germany to berlin this is still going to be a uh, business industrial center of germany you basically got to drive on this uh this small road and you got to get off at gas stations in the center of the road. You can't exit because that's communist-controlled uh, East Germany. And it's going to exist like that for the rest of the war. All right, so kind of a victory from for containment. The Soviets did not take West Berlin. And again, you create this strong buffer state in West Germany. All right, final part of U.S. containment in Europe, at least the final part we're going to talk about, is going to be in reaction to... Well, it, it's not going to be initially a reaction. It's going to come out before this this thing we're about to talk about. But what the various Western powers are going to do is they still distrustful of the Soviet Union. They're going to determine that if these guys do try to be military aggressive, we'd probably do a better job of resisting them if we could coordinate things better. So at the, this point, 48-49... UK's got its military, France has got a military, United States has got its military, their allies some have their own militaries. If the Soviets invaded, preventing them from taking territory would require a lot of coordination. So Britain's military would have to phone France's military. You'd have to say, hey, these guys are invading here. Could you send your soldiers here? Hey, we're having to evacuate people here. Could you send supplies there? And coordinating between different nations' militaries is difficult. So what um, the United States is going to propose is that the various pro-Western, pro-capitalist countries unite their militaries together under a single organization. Now, it's not going to have full control of their militaries, and it's just going to be specifically to protect this Western Europe. But they're going to come up with this thing called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. All NATO will be is that there's going to be a single military government, and this is going to be initially in uh, 
I believe it. Yeah, it's in Belgium. Uh, it starts out there, but uh, uh, it's going to be in Belgium. And what NATO will be is all these different countries will send generals to this NATO. And what NATO will be is going to have a head who will, if there's a threat from the Soviets and their allies, uh, this and maybe an attack from, you know, coming in this direction, it's going to better coordinate the militaries of the uh, NATO members. So initially, this is going to be Britain, France, United States. Uh, then we'll later see, eventually see Spain, Portugal uh, join this thing. Uh, Austria will eventually join it. West Germany, Denmark, Norway, and the United States and Canada will also be a part of it. And all this is is almost like a gang. This is our gang. And NATO is going to promise, you know, unite these militaries. And it's also going to basically say to the U Soviet Union uh, and its allies, if you attack one of us, you attack all of us. You can almost think of this as gang warfare on an international scale. So N North Atlantic Treaty Organization uh, will be uh, this this um, uh, ganging up of these various pro-capitalist, pro-Western countries. You attack one of us, you attack all of us. Uh, Greece, you see them joining it. Again, pro-capitalist government had won out. Uh, Turkey will also join. Again, the U.S. supported Turkey in that um, Black Sea affair with the Soviet Union. Well, if you're the Soviet Union, you see these guys forming a gang. How's that making you feel? Again, you don't trust them either. So what the Soviet Union will do is it's going to get its buddies and it's going to form something called the Warsaw Pact. What the Warsaw Pact will be is these pro-Soviet Union, uh, pro-communist governments will click up themselves in order to coordinate their militaries better and also, again, to tell these Western uh, European United States that if you attack one of us, you attack all of us. So again, gang warfare on a, uh, a large scale. Now, NATO, its uh, goals are going to almost immediately change because you're going to see a different element uh, to NATO because in 1949, oh, by the way, first head of NATO is going to be this guy, Dwight D. Eisenhower, we'll talk about in a little bit here. But uh, almost immediately, NATO is going to be faced with a problem because uh, the Soviet Union, um, oh gosh, I don't know where the heck this went, uh, Soviet Union in 1949 will... A test an atomic weapon. We're going to talk more about how the Soviet Union does this in 1949, but one of NATO's goals at this point will be how to coordinate an evacuation in case there's a nuclear attack. So Soviet Union uh, detonates an atomic bomb, and now NATO has to coordinate an evacuation if they start using this uh, bomb on these Western European allies. Um, after the Soviets uh, test their nuclear bomb. The United States will detect it because of radiation. Now we're in a world where there are two different nuclear powers. Um, and so as a result, this basically makes this sort of game even more dangerous. What you'll see is uh, the United States start um, threatening something called uh, a, a total annihilation. So if you uh, attack one, us or one of our allies with a nuclear weapon, we're going to retaliate and uh, with our own nuclear weapons. So if you use one, just know that we're going to use our weapons as well. And what you'll see both sides, uh, when the United States announces policy, Soviet Union will counter with their own policy. If you use nuclear weapons on one of us or our allies, uh, we're going to retaliate and we're going to have our own mutually assured destruction. So uh, again, this is this uh, uh, gang warfare on a uh, nuclear scale. All right, so the thing is, this, this, this situation in Europe is incredibly scary, but it's going to end up working out in the United States' favor uh, because even though the Soviet Union is scary and threatening and, you know, there's almost war, the Soviet Union isn't going to make any gains in Europe or any significant gains from the 1940s until or after uh, Second World War until the end of the Soviet Union. They don't add any new territory. No new countries fall to communism. Now, you know, there's going to be some countries that might, you know, make overtures towards the Soviet Union, but communism doesn't expand in Europe. Containment's effective in Europe. It's not going to be as effective in other parts of the globe, however.